everyone. Uh, this is Kurt Egley with the PPI Group, and I'm welcoming you on part two of extending BIM to the whole project team. Uh, thanks for joining us. If you missed part one, uh, I think we've already got it posted. So um, not right now, but you might want to go back and check that one out. Let's go on with part two here. Um, now, I'll, I'll give you the agenda in just a few minutes or in a moment, but um, that's a little bit about myself up there. Um, what, what we've been doing with this webcast is talking about how cloud services together with desktop applications from Autodesk give you the capabilities to have a direct competitive advantage. And this is for architects, engineers, construction, contractors, and owners as well. Um, whatever your discipline is, um, BIM can help with that. It's and not just a tactical, technical advantage, but it also gives you direct business opportunities that you never had before um, in the way that um, you can use that technology to um, mirror the way that you run your business. So um, I think um, what I'd like to do today is drill in briefly on solution after solution here. I, I chose a number of them. Uh, kind of taking up where we left off before. I haven't got to the rendering aspect yet, so I'm including it in this one. <laughs> we'll, we'll see how we do through um, an hour here, if I can get, get through all of these topics. Um, one way that I, I'm going to do this so that it goes, um, goes faster for us is um, I last week I went into each of the applications that I wanted to uh, work with and I recorded my desktop as I worked on them and jumping back and forth between the cloud. So uh, coupling those together, this way I can go uh, through a lot of um, a lot of different products in a short period of time. So you'll see me bounce back and forth here and not just do PowerPoint. So um, so what, what we talked about before was the way that BIM is an integrated process, right? So um, part of the advantage is it's coordinated, consistent information across all of us on the project team. So architects, engineers, you get into fabrication, to owners on the um, operate and, and maintain end of things. Um, that kind of communication and that shared central model, if you want to call it central, um, it will lead to that integrated process that can help us um, uh, work through the, the project's development. So um, when we were talking last time, we, we started going through um, uh, analysis especially. So like I was doing heating and cooling loads, I'd start some in Revit, then we'd go up into the cloud, so on and so forth. Um, I wanted to explore visualization just a little bit more here with you, though. Um, so in terms of, of visualization, some of it's about exploring your ideas within the context of the project. So that's important as we're doing design development. Um, then you start thinking about other ways that you might use that. So communication, um, you have ideas, so you're trying to communicate them Maybe it's in terms of um, you're working with a subcontractor. I, I was working uh, in Texas, and um, one of the general contractors down there was saying, since uh, English as a second language is a problem, uh, sometimes with his workers, he, he uses the BIM model to better explain what he wants to have built. So um, that's one aspect of it. The other part of the communication is uh, when you're trying to make design decisions in a, in a speedy fashion, right? So which one of these materials do we want? There's a price impact associated with it, so on and so forth. And the other aspect of it might be, um, which is probably the part you went to first, which is uh, marketing visuals, right? So um, winning business, right? So um, as Autodesk commonly does, um, they'll take some kind of a tool and they'll overlap it into other products that they make. And um, I took three of them uh, to talk about here over the next couple of minutes. Autodesk Revit, Showcase, and 3ds Max. 
So each one of these has a visualization aspect to it. Um, and either one of them could actually be, any one of them could be pushed pretty far here. Um, the center of the universe for Revit, though, is really aimed at in-process visualization. Now, you can actually do some renderings that are pretty realistic in nature there, but um, the aim of it from Autodesk is to allow you to better visualize during the design development process and through into construction. Um, showcase, I'll, I'll drill into this one in a few minutes. Uh, showcase is really about communication. So it's an immersive, interactive environment, and then it has storytelling features yet um, besides. So you'll see more what I'm talking about when we get in there. And then 3ds Max is for uh, cinematic animation and near photorealism. So um, I'll actually be offering a class um, here at PPI Group on 3ds Max for Revit users in case you're interested in that. So the arrows that you're seeing though, probably Revit is the tool that the uh, model is getting built in and then you open it up in one of the other two products and maybe tweak it, like maybe over in um, 3ds Max, you're um, tweaking the lights and, and such. But you don't have to rework it because um, you need the construction documents in order to get the building built. And you're not having to rebuild it to do visual communication or photorealism. So um, let's, whoops, here. Um, let me, let me play um, um, one of my rendering recordings here. I thought what I'd do first is to start with the in-process rendering, um, in-product rendering of Revit. So um, this is without the use of the cloud. And I, I did want to show you that, uh, like with artificial lights, we can actually speed this up uh, dramatically if you're only rendering like in a conference room at one end of the building just turn off the lights and tell them not to think about it in the opposite end of the building um, I'm not going to let it render for you because it actually is very time intensive um, uh, here's the cloud aspect of it though um, I'm going to do uh, I'll do a still rendering first here and send that up into the cloud and let it crunch on it up there and yeah oh by the way um, eat your heart out. I got 2 million um, cloud credits. <laughs> um, yeah, they, they, they treat me well here. Autodesk treats us well here. Um, so so um, there's, I'll, I'll tell you, or you can find out more about cloud credits and, and how, you know, when you buy a certain amount of products, then you get a certain amount of cloud credits. And then some of these cloud services under subscription will ding you um, a couple credits here and there every time that you do some kind of a rendering or the like. Um, once I did the rendering and I go up into a browser and I'm visiting it up there to take a look at the rendering, um, what, what's pretty interesting about it is we well, can see that that actually still took 23 minutes up there to get that done. Um, that's kind of interesting. But if I decide now that I want to adjust the exposure, you know, like it's too dark, um, I'd like it to be re-rendered at a higher resolution, it doesn't have to come back to the product in order to get that done. So what you were seeing earlier when I was working in Revit and I said render into the cloud, it looked at my login, looked up how many cloud credits I had, dinged a couple of them, and then um, rendered while I went back to work. Um, this, we'll look up here at the top, and maybe I'll pause it for just a second before this scrolls off. Um, I decided to do a, a stereo panorama rendering, so it actually looked a little weird for us here. Uh, once we get done. Um, but um, this one made out of cardboard looks like one I could actually afford. <laughs> <laughs> within our budget. Right? Yeah, within our budget. <laughs> um, anyway, um, you'll see now that I've already pumped it up into the cloud, the model is up there. It's actually in, in little bits and pieces strewn across servers up there. But um, it can come back to the model and re-render it or render it in a different format uh, for me. So for example, um, I'm going to do an illuminance study, um, and I think I ended up choosing 100 foot candles to 1,000 foot candles for my final rendering there. Um, and I'll show you what that looks like. 
and you see how that has that kind of green circle up there to let you know um, that it's working on it. And the panorama one has a little slide bar across the bottom there. And here's a solar study, for example. Uh, so maybe I want to, we're inside, you can't even really see the sun. So I don't think I ended up showing you that one. But here's that um, stereo uh, uh, panorama. Um, even though I had my camera set up looking in one direction, when you tell it to do the panorama, it turns around um, 360 and makes a big old bubble there for you so that now within the browser, I can explore in all directions based on where the camera was. And here's that um, array of foot candles and the illuminance that I chose with blue being the uh, darker areas and yellow being the lighter as well. So what you were seeing there is the rendering that starts in Revit here, doesn't include these other two products, uh, starts in product in Revit, and then I turned around and said use the cloud instead. Um, it's, I think one of them actually still took an hour to get done. Maybe it was that stereo panorama. Um, it, it would have, I don't know, even if they had the capability on my desktop, um, I don't know how many hours it would have taken to get that done here. So a, a really good prime candidate for uh, cloud services. Uh, now let me show you Showcase next. So this is that visual communication tool that I talked about. It'll make more sense once I play this if you've never seen it before. A um, couple of things I like about it. Well, for starters, I got the Revit model, and I just opened it up in Showcase. And then from there, I can say, you know, I'd like to just put an immersive environment around this. They have several of them in there, which you can make your own. Um, and then you just size it. The idea is to give it some context instead of floating on a black screen, right, when you're trying to talk to, say, an owner about materials. Um, now I say, let's go over and take a look at the front entrance. It's not just a snapshot. It's a, not a JPEG. It's just it's basically a transporter. I think of it that way, that it transports me over to um, a different part of the building. And uh, like with the orbit, for example, instead of setting up a big path, what I can do is say, uh, from here, use an eggshell, if you will, kind of a shape and just start orbiting around the front um, of the building. So let's, let's stop for just a second here. I'm going to pause for just a moment. Consider the workflow. OK, so Revit users, you already know you can zoom and pan and orbit within the model. You pick a 3D view, and away you go. Let's talk about extending BIM to the bigger team, though. right? So different ways that this might be used. Um, is that in anticipation of a meeting, a project manager wants to be able to discuss an idea. He wants to be able to focus and direct his discussion. He wants to talk about different materials that might be um, possibilities that have a different dollar impact on the project. This is going to cost you $50,000 more. Do we want to do this or not? Those kind of conversations. Imagine being able to take your Revit project, open it up in Showcase, save a few viewpoints like this, and I'm going to show you material alternatives next, and then turn around, be able to go to that meeting and quickly focus the discussion. I'll, I'll show you what this looks like next then. Here I am with brick as it existed in the Revit model to begin with. Now I try a different alternative, and I say, how about this kind of brown brick here? What do you think about that? What do I think about that? Maybe Adobe. Let's see what that looks like. I'm shifting materials. Once I make my decision, then I probably am going to go back to the Revit model in order to update it with the material that we decided to move forward with. But it's just that easy and just that fast to get that part of it done. So it compresses the timeline on decisions. Um, when you're able to work so, so quickly between products, um, Showcase and 3ds Max are both included in Building Design Suite Premium and Building Design Suite Ultimate. So if, you're, if you've got the Building Design Suite, by the way, uh, one of those two flavors of the Design Suite, 
um, it's in there, uh, whether or not you're using it or not, um, you might want to think about it, right? So like with the brick material, if it's given to the outside of the building back in Revit, then it's going to render as expected in all three products because the material library is shared across the Autodesk product line. Um, the construction documents read properly, so consequently the building gets built as expected. And if an estimator is doing um, material takeoffs with Revit, it looks for square footage or volume of concrete or in the like, and you get, uh, based on the material, you get an accurate material takeoff without having to reassign re it uh, across different products. So let's, um, let's move on to a different one here. I wanted to talk about Navisworks a little bit, um, three different aspects of it. Um, one would be about uh, predicting uh, and communicating the schedule. So challenge on the left, opportunity on the right, which I'll show you that. Um, increasing your estimating power. Challenge on the left, opportunity on the right. Coordinating for interference detection. Challenge on the left, opportunity on the right. Let's take a look at those in action here. So <clears throat> the first one that I wanted to um, start with is clash detection. And I'm going to be using uh, structural members like columns and framing um, against the HVAC here. So one value about Revit is its ability to integrate, share, and review models multi-format data as well. Um, it has an amazing grocery list of um, different file formats that it can take in on an aggregated model. Um, consequently, you gain control over the project outcomes. Um, you have an opportunity to identify conflicts before the construction begins. Early in the process, it doesn't cost anything. It's just a gleam in your eye. Okay, well, your time uh, to get something coordinated. Later on, um, now we're talking jackhammers and the like to be able to make a change, right? Um, to be able to coordinate across disciplines, I, I think about ductwork right away because um, chances are steel's not going to get out of the way of the duct. The duct has to go around the steel. Um, you can get a lot of um, value out of that in no time flat. Um, I did the um, clash detection, and now I'm going to write a report out of it. So we'll let that run. And the report comes out, in this case, I told it to come out in HTML format so that we could open it up with a browser. So uh, usually the workflow is a lot of team members uh, uh, post their models so that um, you can, or one person anyway, can aggregate the model and then do the clash and then share the report with the rest of the team members here. So you can see in, in blue is one of the set of the members and in pink is the other set of members that I um, decided to uh, clash against each other. And I can drill into each one of those screens from here um, to take a look uh, at the two highlighted members, in this case, duct and steel framing and the redlining that I did, the markup that I did. So this is an example of BIM project enabling for reporting and tracking identified problems. So the next thing I thought I'd show you is on the quantification end of things um, to bring those same quantities from that aggregated model. So here with the quantification that they've added in to um, Revit, the first one that you saw was uh, um, Navis quantification they brought into Navisworks. So the first one that you saw was Navisworks Manage. Now the quantification and the timeliner that I'm going to show you, the 4D aspect, is in Navisworks Manage, but it's also in Navisworks Simulate. So if you only have that, which is part of Building Design Suite Premium. So um, what I'm looking at are the um, item and resource management. So we can browse the item collections and um, 
and take a look at items in the list, switch to resource view, and um, generate uh, quantities from there. So the last thing I wanted to show you here was uh, what we call timeliner. So this is 4D simulation. And I think construction companies especially are going to find um, this um, to be a, a really important tool to them. Um, you think about the juggling act that is getting workers, equipment, material on site at the right time, uh, you know, the crane in place and so on and so forth. It's a lot of responsibility to manage an army of men and women like that and the resources that go with that and a big price tag associated with it. And you're seeing the um, Gantt chart playing down at the bottom as a part of Timeliner. You can assign your own tasks in there, but uh, it'll take in Microsoft Project or Primavera files and map that to the um, items within the project as well so that we can get graphic sequencing that um, normally is, is pretty hard to um, figure out what's going on. I've, I've worked with just plain Gantt charts before, and when you look at the sequencing in the Gantt chart, it looks like, um, like nothing is going to be a problem for you. When you match that up graphically with the model, like you just saw here a moment ago, um, it becomes really obvious where the problems are. And... Um, you have a chance to correct them before um, it's too late. So let's shift gears a little bit here. That was that was Navisworks. Um, I'd like to uh, talk about field layout next. So um, the business issue we're talking about here is um, I got my beautiful model done, my virtual model done in Revit, and now um, we're we're going to have to figure out exactly where to put that duct hanger, uh, where to put that pipe hanger. Maybe the work involves um, a renovation where the concrete is existing for the floor and there's deviations in it. In the model, it looks perfect, <laughs> um, but maybe that's not the reality for what really is um, happening out in the real world. So those two different things, I thought I'd start first by showing, um, talking about one workflow here. Um, for the field layout solution, um, I'm, I'm going to show you Revit with um, uh, Autodesk Point Layout loaded on top of it. Now, APL or Autodesk Point Layout is not part of Building Design Suite. So you're not going to see that in there. This is an add-on that I loaded on top of Revit. And by the way, uh, when you load it, it can put itself on top of AutoCAD. It can put itself on top of Navisworks. actually does that automatically. Um, I'm, I'm using Revit for this um, project, though. Um, so without the use of cloud, I just, without the use of the cloud, I can use... Um, Autodesk Point Layout on top of Revit to generate a CSV or a DXF file and then take that to a TopCon total station and do field layout in the, um, from there if I want to. So there's one workflow. And collect them if you're trying to compare it to the model. You can collect it, like in the case of the concrete deviation I was talking about earlier, and then take that file and bring it back to... Um, the originating software, in this case Revit, with um, Autodesk Point Layout, and do a comparison of the two. Um, I wanted to um, take a little closer look at this aspect of what I had brought up last time, though. So um, BIM 360 is a Autodesk BIM 360 is what um, Autodesk's been calling a collection of cloud services and kind of a some, some of them have some desktop or iPad kind of applications that you install, or all of them do. And um, I wanted to hone in on, on one of them, um, BIM 360 Glue. And I decided to do this one right after the Navisworks part because it's kind of you know, a flavor of Navisworks in the cloud. At least you'll see some similarities there. Um, so I'm going to show you the um, Revit to Glue 
um, aspect of it. And then we'll talk about what kind of a workflow could be around this as well. So um, with that, I'll bring up this video. So I'm going to, I start with the um, Revit model, and um, I want to add in points, control points, every place where there's an intersection on the grid for the second floor. I want to show you how fast this is. <laughs> um, you know, basically, I just uh, create a big uh, crossing window around the whole thing and say finish. <laughs> um, anyway, pretty cool. Okay, so now. I surely it's harder than that. That's um, don't let anybody tell you that it's that easy because we still want to get paid the big bucks, right? Um, so anyway, I, I went ahead and made the points kind of big like donuts out here so you could see them a little bit better. And then I'm going to turn around and tag them, uh, tag all of them. Now, one thing I probably should have done in this video um, was um, instead of just having the point number show up, I can have it uh, show up with the description of what intersection it's at as well. And then I turned around and said, you know, now I want to, instead of automatically do the whole grid, I'd like to manually add some in uh, for where the sprinklers are going to go, in this case, um, by element. So you can just come in and pick, pick, pick on the areas that you, um, places where you'd like to have points placed. Uh, the point of this, maybe that's a, the point, yeah, the point of point layout <laughs> is that if no, you, no pun intended. Yeah, no, I can't help but make fun out of it, but um, the point of it is um, there's either certain ones that you want to verify in the field um, and get the points in the hand of somebody that has the hard hat out in the field um, and or you're trying to figure out where to put that pipe hanger so that all you're looking at is just the you know bottom of structure or big concrete um, deck uh, overhead, right? So um, how do you how do you do that? Well, you place them, you hit glue it, and if you have an account, um, it uh, I'm now shifting over to BIM 360 glue and taking a look at what I just uploaded there. Um, there's those points hovering in space, and um, the greater extended team now, if they have a login, can explore the building there in glue. And I'm, I'm not doing clash detection. That's actually um, one of the hot parts of, um, of glue in the cloud here. Um, for me, I'm concentrating on the points. And I'm, I'm picking on the points, and I'm going to make a point set out of them. Well, at least I was just showing you the properties of it. Um, I'm going to have it search on, on sprinklers. Now, this is from... Um, uh, a, a data set that I did here at um, the TopCon Roadshow that we had. So maybe some of you were here uh, at, I guess, a couple of months ago we did that. Um, and so maybe some of you on the webcast were here. Uh, we did this live, uh, a colleague and I, uh, where I worked in the model. We pumped it up to glue. And then um, I say add a set, um, give it a description, and then I turn around and say, now alert my colleague, um, this was Curtis Huggins, that um, there's a point set that's ready for him uh, to work with, um, with his um, TopCon robotic. So that's the next step that we do, that I do here next. And there it pumps it up, and I click on it, and then say, now communicate. So, so... Um, collaboration in the in the cloud. Some of it's about um, getting the model into the extended team, and then the other aspect of it, uh, sharing data and communication, like I'm doing here with Curtis, for example. So when I when I send that to him, you're only seeing that part of the workflow. Um, I let me just just because of time circumstances, let me talk through. Um, where you could go with this. So, so we're looking at, at 360 glue here for coordination and collaboration, and, and I used um, point layout to get um, to augment that. Um, if, if you have a TopCon LN100 robotic, uh, you might be interested in the next step, which is what we were showing that day at the TopCon Roadshow, where two cloud services 360 glue and 360 layout are synchronized together at the Autodesk end out at the server end. And what happens there is 
um, I work on the model, in this case in Revit, and I use point layout to generate the points. I upload that to glue like you just saw. I just press that glue it button and it pumps up there and hits glue and then I say um, a point set will be shared. Um, here's the part you aren't seeing unless you came to the TopCon Roadshow. Um, it synchronizes to BIM 360 layout and on the other end Curtis gets my notification that there's a point set for him. He uses an iPad and not only sees the model with the iPad as he's walking around with the hard hat on out, out on site, but he's controlling the TopCon LN100 uh, from, it's robotic, from his um, iPad as well. And we can have it be a two-way streak here where he collects it if we're doing field verification and you want to look for deviation as built collection can come back to glue and upload and then back down again into Revit for deviation analysis. All right. We're doing pretty good on time, I think. Yeah. Well, okay. You're, you're screaming right through. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I think it's, I think it's worth it. I, you know, I, I love driving product uh, directly myself here. Um, and you know, if, if you guys want to find out more about this, you know, give us a shout. And, and I'll come and we'll roll up our sleeves together and take a look uh, live with any one of these solutions. Um, I'd be happy to do that. But um, boy, we can really make a lot of progress if, if I can just sit down and hit record because I can just jump from thing to thing. Uh, I, the next one I wanted to show you here was um, A360 Collaboration for Revit. So terrible name, I think. Uh, collaboration for Revit is actually a product slash service, right? Um, the, the words here. Um, the key values are about access to project data, communication, and connecting the project team, getting all of your documents together in one place. So it happens at the cloud end for the storage of your Revit model and associated documents and communication but you're still running Revit on the desktop. You're just opening up the file and sharing the file out in the cloud. So consequently, um, you don't get the uh, firewall in the way that um, you would have to deal with in an IT investment at your own firm. So maybe this will make more sense if I just, um, if I go ahead and play this for you here once. I made a, a collection of, of um, different things I just wanted to show you from that. So here I am, Revit, hitting Revit um, and hitting that file, but it's actually on, on the cloud and not my S drive or something like that uh, locally here. Um, additionally, the communication tool um, lets you see who's working on what model, uh, when they've synchronized, um, gives you a chance to chat with um, the other users um, as far as, you know, like, for example, here I'm zooming into, and I notice that there's all the space behind those chairs there. So I take one of the team members or maybe talk to the whole team if it was, you know, important enough for that, capture an area, and then say, you know, what's up with that, right? Um, consequently, um, right here within the context of the model as I'm working, I can get feedback and solve these. So um, when you're working on a model by yourself, and this is probably true of AutoCAD with a floor plan, um, there's, there's only there's only at the moment yourself to have to worry about, I guess. Um, as soon as you start to work share, the communication rises. The level of communication needs to rise. And Autodesk is building in ways to get that done. Like what you're seeing here, for example, is outside of Revit now, the other aspect of collaboration for Revit, which is hitting a team hub where the model is loaded and associated documents and its own communication channel. 
this is a prime example of extending the uh, BIM building information model to an extended team to the whole project team so if you have a question like for example here about parking do we have enough parking what are the requirements and I, I chose Seattle in this case um, I, I just say hey I, I know that let me um, put the uh, parking requirements up there and the PDF gets put up you see it for a moment it'll say um, preparing it what it does is it has um, it has two well last I heard over 200 different file formats um, that it will prepare it on the server end so that you don't need to load individual plugins on everybody's user um, and in their browser in order to be able to see the file so that's that's another aspect um, it's a subtle aspect but um, a way to make sure that um, collaboration happens as easily as possible all right so um, may maybe this is a, a video that I had um, created of um, animation in Max. Uh, maybe it's individual JPEGs where I had rendered. Um, maybe it's um, the model itself, <laughs> of course, like you're seeing here. Um, and then, um, you know, another aspect I wanted to show you was um, the strength of being able to search the model. So true, I have the model. Um, in front of me, but say that I wanted to bring up a, a model explorer and drill down in to concentrate on the stairs. So um, for in this case, you're seeing the supports, the handrails, the top rails, stairs, railings, etc. All Revit components highlighted that I want to see. The rest of the building kind of ghosts out, sort of turns the glass around it so that you can see the context of it. And that way I can explore the model more readily, um, uh, even just through a browser here. I'm kind of envious of this part as a Revit user. I, I guess it's more like maybe Navisworks. It's um, uh, dynamic um, sectioning. So um, in, in Revit, if you're not a Revit user, we will uh, move the section box out. And then when you release it, then it makes the cut. Um, in Navisworks and in collaboration for Revit, as I move it, it cuts uh, through the model automatically on the fly here. And it's really good to be able to get in to a tight little area like the plenum, for example, and be able to um, explore it, uh, you know, for conflicts and the like. And then well, the last thing that I wanted to show you with this was the um, communication tool for comments. So. A little bit earlier, I was showing you in Revit how I could make a comment about um, the amount of wasted space behind the stairs, for example. Here's what it looks like in the cloud end of this. I say I want to comment on the sign, and then it actually makes a link between the two. And you can see a little leader that comes off of it as you orbit around and explore the model. So that's um, A360 collaboration for Revit that we looked at there. Um, the tenants of it, or the you know the pillars of it, are easy access to project data, and I think you saw that um, both from the Revit end hitting the project data, and from the browser end hitting the project data to the extended team. Um, Enhanced communication, this happens on the Revit side as well as in the browser. You saw that from a couple different angles that I looked at it. And um, the entire project team um, actually is, um, okay, so, so think about the workflow that you would normally have on a project if you're not using collaboration for Revit. So I'm still going to work with a, with a larger team. And I hope every Friday that say I'm the architect and I'm hoping that the mechanical engineer and the electrical engineer and the structural engineer, so on and so forth, will share their model with me so that I can see what the update looks like. And maybe two out of three give me that model. And then the next one doesn't come for three weeks. You've seen that before. I have to compose it together myself or replace the file. So there's some BIM management that happens. And I see what it looks like. 
um, last Friday, if that's when they gave me the file, with the use in the cloud, if you're invited, now this is a secure area, but if you're invited to the cloud to be able to work on it there in the team hub with the others, this is multiple organizations hitting the same area at the same time. So now that's not to say that as I'm moving a wall around as an architect, everybody sees walls moving around. There's still a publish button up there where I say, I haven't quite made up my mind there, so I'm not going to publish that view yet. Um, but at some point, if I, it's just as easy as hitting that button to say expose that to the greater project team so the owner, whoever, um, can see how the project is progressing. And we get things solved right away. Um, the, um, a couple of weeks ago, or, well, this, this is January 2016, so um, if you're watching the recorded webcast, a couple of weeks ago, um, Autodesk um, rolled this out for a global launch. So prior to this, it had just been uh, actually North America, but you know, United States centric. Uh, now, so if you have project teams that are global in nature, if you have a Paris office or the like, um, you can have those in, involved in the project as well. I just wanted to talk briefly about getting the BIM um, yet with this. So um, we, we can help you through this process if, you know, you're all going to be at different stages. Um, you can break this down um, into, into phases, if you will, in order to get there. Um, I thought I'd talk to architects and engineers first and then talk to contractors because it's a little different for both. Um, phase one for architects and engineers, you might want to consider um, just start with concentrating on model creation. Um, it, it just inherently, the 3D parametric design elements take place in Revit. Um, visualization, you're going to probably want to do that right away because you just can't stand it, right? <laughs> but um, depending on how you're going to use it, um, you know, if you're if you're new to BIM. Um, you're going you're gonna to love that aspect of it. You create the model for the construction documents, and then almost as a byproduct, you have an opportunity for visualization. And then, of course, documentation outputs. Now, for phase two, um, leverage what you have created in phase one. Um, in, in part one of this uh, two-part series here, I concentrated quite a bit on heating and cooling loads, different kind of analysis that we could do. Um, I, I didn't do, we were going to do a structural analysis as a part of this as well, um, because there's, um, for you structural engineers, there's uh, Revit where we place the loads, then there's Robot if you have that as a part of Building Design Suite, which is a desktop application. You can do seismic um, analysis and the like, and then there's also a cloud aspect to that, but um, I think we're probably going to do a uh, a uh, webcast here in the near future that just revolves around that because it's kind of a subject all of its own. So um, be looking for that from PPI group in the near future. Um, so for, for phase two for architects and engineers, link to the analysis. So just like I said with the structural engineers, uh, you would link for um, probably the cloud service in order to get that done, it's considerably faster. And then start using those models for sustainable design. And then as a phase three, integrate that. So um, mostly when I talk about integration, start thinking about the project life cycle. So um, involve the owners. Um, we can do this at any, at any point. Um, another one that I, I think I'll probably do as a webcast as well is the use of um, Revit as an inherent holder of um, uh, non-graphic information associated with the uh, building elements. Consequently, you could put information in the model about when a filter needs to be changed, when a boiler, um, you should start budgeting for replacement of that boiler. It's inherently a facility management and maintenance management tool on its own. And architects and engineers and, and construction on the construction end 
are differentiating their um, firms and their companies uh, by delivering FM and maintenance management ready models to the owners. So um, either the owners do it and or um, you can be doing it on the architects, engineers and construction side of um, the process as well. A value add to the owner that maybe your competitor is not, not giving. Uh, on the getting to BIM for contractors, um, some of it will be kind of the same. So phase one, uh, we're talking about creating models, um, learning how to do that. So, you know, take my essentials class, <laughs> that sort of thing. Um, take advantage of that 3D parametric building components, do the visualization, do the construction documents. Um, when you get to leverage uh, for yourself or for um, you Canadians that are um, online leverage uh, for this, um, reuse the models that were created by the design team. So the reuse might be where you take the model and you create what uh, we call in Revit parts or Revit assemblies. Um, maybe you're taking a wall and breaking it down into uh, constructible pieces, uh, you know, concrete, poured in place, tilt up panels, something like that. Um, do quantity takeoffs from it. Uh, do the 4D sequencing that you saw with Navisworks Timeliner there and, and uh, maybe take it, if you're familiar with level of development, if it was at level of development 200, LOD 200, maybe move that model up to 350, 400. 400 would be constructability and fabrication level uh, development. Um, you can um, take the model beyond that. That probably would be your phase two. And phase three is the integration. So um, linking the scheduling applications, estimating applications, um, and now we're talking operate and maintain, so O&M applications. Um, that would be your part uh, for um, punch lists and such like that, and the as-built uh, given over to the owner. So um, BIM, BIM gives us um, opportunities um, for the model to be leveraged throughout uh, the project life cycle. So um, through this series of um, two series uh, webcast and the different series of products that I've been through, we've been looking at um, uh, clear from the conceptual end of things and the energy analysis, so on and so forth, clear through to the management end, end of things. Um, having that model and maintaining it through the building life cycle without redoing the work um, is one way that complementary products like this um, can uh, augment uh, what you've ever been doing before within your model. Um, take those CAD designs and put them in an immersive 3D presentation. Explore design options with your design team and customer, um, if that's the owner is, is your customer and make decisions on the fly. Um, it's about accelerating the feedback loop when you're getting to that point so that um, decisions can be made and made quickly. So um, with uh, my last slide here, I just wanted to bring this part back up again too um, about the, the life cycle of the project. Um, again, it's a lot of the same players, structural, architectural, MEP, civil, uh, and owners <clears throat> working in a multidiscipline model, documenting, visualizing, doing clash detection, 4D sequencing, quantification, consequently estimating, scheduling, and then um, facility management, the like. So the the issues we've been talking about require top-down support, and I, I recognize that if you haven't. Um, if your firm hasn't moved along to the point where you're adopting BIM, uh, it's a strategic initiative, right? But um, even though you need top-down support in order to get this done, the executives in your firm understand that. Um, they're the ones who can appreciate the strategic value of BIM and, and it not being just an expense, but as an investment in your firm or your company. 
And um, I think you will find that the vast majority of um, users of BIM report seeing positive returns on their investment. I do believe, Kurt, that that wraps up um, part two of our BIM webinar series. So as always, thank you very much for helping us out and providing such um, valuable information. And I, as Kurt mentioned, if you have any questions about either uh, parts of the of the series as it relates to BIM, how to get started, if, have a conversation with us. We're happy to, to be a resource to you. So we're going to go ahead and conclude the webinar. Look for the, the post-webinar email coming up and um, so you can share those archived and recorded versions with your colleagues as necessary. So thanks again. Have a wonderful week and we'll see you at our next webinar.